Thank you very much for the introduction. So I will talk about uh, so one of my favorite topics, which is uh, character sums and especially real character sums. So sums of plus minus one defined by characters. So I will talk about two results, which are like uh, in two papers with uh, Oleg Siklerman from Bristol and Yulnes Lamzuri from Nancy. Okay, so let's start. So if an uh, object we will look at is we take a character modulo Q, we can take Q a prime and we look at uh, partial sums of characters. So the classical example, you take the legendary symbol. So you take a prime and you have the application which takes, which is plus one if N is a square modulo P and minus one if N is not a square modulo P. And you can kind of study averages of these quantities up to some uh, large n and see if you have some cancellation in this sum. So obviously this sum is bounded by capital N and we expect some randomness for the values chi of n. So we expect that they distribute randomly. So for instance, if you take n large enough, you expect half of the time plus one, half of the time minus one. So if you want to show this, you want to show that this sum is a little of n for sufficiently large n and the important thing is uh, so you go up to p and how large n should be to ensure that you have some randomness in this uh, character values so the first uh, classical result in number theory on this is that uh, these sums are bounded by square root of p log p and it's a bound of poly of Vinogradov. it's a simple uh, Fourier argument which shows that essentially if your sum you take more than square root p terms you have like half of the time plus one half of the time minus one so this was the first result in this field and then the people tried to uh, show that these uh, sums cancels for shorter intervals so indeed they could push it a bit and burgess showed that you don't need uh, intervals like larger than square root p but you can take something a bit bigger than p to the quarter plus epsilon and uh, up to now it's kind of the best result apart from like some small improvements we cannot uh, show a better uh, cancellation in shorter intervals without uh, by without uh, any hypothesis so unconditionally so this is related to what i say the problem of the least quadratic non-residue so you take prime p and you want to take a look at the first time you hit minus one. So maybe you, you will have like all your first numbers such that the characters like the legendary symbol is equal to one. And then you look at the first time you hit minus one. So if you look, you use the bound, I told you that you have cancellation for intervals like larger than P to the quarter. You can use some trick by Vinogradov and kind of push it down a bit by some factor square root of E. And so that you are sure that the least quadratic non residue verifies this, this uh, bound. So actually, the trick is just that if you're like plus one on the first, say, uh, k numbers, k primes, but you, you will also be plus one on smooth numbers which have these prime factors. So you can push the argument a bit and uh, show that uh, this bound on the least quadratic non residue. So then there was this famous uh, conjecture of Vinogradov, which says that, in fact, we expect uh, this least quadratic non-residue and we expect cancellation on much shorter intervals. So we expect that if we take uh, the modulus to any small power, uh, there should be cancellation in the quadratic sum and there should be, uh, we, are, we, we should be sure to find uh, quadratic non-residues very small compared to the modulus. So this is like really open uh, up to now, but we can, if we assume the Riemann hypothesis for the uh, directly L function, Ankeny proved that actually we can even have a very strong bound on the least quadratic non-residue, non which is logarithmic bound. And it's used like in some algorithm that uh, we have this very strong bound, but unconditionally we have like some like kind of really large power, one, one quarter. And, and, con and conditionally, we have a like logarithmic bound. So we will look at uh, some related problems 
uh, on this, but not directly on, we will not study the least quadratic non-residue, but we will look at sign changes of character sums. So of course, if you look at the character sum, so you take a uh, quadratic character, not, you don't take only the legend or symbol, you can take any discriminant D, and you look at the real product, quadratic character associated to D, and you form the partial sums. <coughs> so then you look at the number, so you, you look when this sum change, changes sign. So of course, uh, if you change signs on the average, it means that you hit many uh, minus one values, because like if you can draw this, like you can draw this as a random walk. So when you have plus one, you go up. When you have minus one, you go down. And you will look at how many times you cross the x axis. So when you hit, when you hit zero, and then you go up again, you go down, etc. And you want to know if you take all the first, uh, say, um, x values of this sum. So you like, sum up to one, up to two, up to three, etc. And you want to understand like how many times you hit this. Uh, so you, this partial sum changes sign. So this goes back to, uh, it's actually, this goes back to a very old question of Shaola and Fekete, which asked like, in general for discriminants, can we show that uh, we have like an infinite number of sign changes when the discriminant goes to infinity, for instance. Can we show that for some Ds? Can we show that for all Ds? Can we show that for almost all Ds? Can we find like some discriminants such that it never, Sign, uh, changes sign. So for instance, that the random rock stays up uh, the x-axis. So it never, you know, never have a value of n such that this sum is equal to zero. So there are many questions which are like, which are kind of open on this, uh, on this, on this problem. And if we show that there are like, for instance, infinitely many sign changes, can we quantify the number of these sign changes? So can we uh, say if I have a discriminant D and I look at the uh, first D sums that maybe I will have a D to the quarter sign changes. And can I say something maybe stronger, which is related to what I say, can I uh, localize where the, uh, these sign changes uh, happen? So can I have like uh, sign changes at the beginning of the interval? So for instance, in the Vinogradov range, if I take D to the epsilon, I look at the first partial sums, am I sure that here I will change sign for uh, some discriminant Ds? So it's really related to the distribution of uh, quadratic residues and uh, non-residues, <coughs> modulo some prime or modulo some, some discriminant D. So before like stating any results on this uh, problem like that we obtained, I will like talk about some uh, related problem that we can think uh, about a probabilistic model for this question. So a probabilistic model for this question comes from uh, the beginning of 20th century. Vintner introduced a famous model to model the Möbius function. So he wanted to have like a good random model for the Möbius function. So he introduced what is called the Rademacher random variables. So how does this uh, work? So you take a sequence of uh, random variable, which are like indexed by primes, and you just ask that the probability to be one is the same as the probability to be minus one. So it's like one half on the primes. But then we are interested like as a character, as a multiplicative function, the Membius function is a multiplicative function. so. It's not a completely independent situation. It's just independent on the primes. And then we extend our function on all the integers. And we uh, define what is called a Rademacher random multiplicative function, which is just extending the values at any n by multiplicativity. So for all square free integers n, we define fn as a product of fp. And we put 0 on non square free integers. So clearly, f is, is give me a random multiplicative function because f of mn is clearly f of m times f of n because I defined it as a product of fp on the prime. So this is a way to define what is called a random multiplicative function. And we can ask 
when we have a questions on characters or on Mobius function, we can translate it in this uh, uh, random size and a uh, random side and see uh, if we can obtain some results for this model, which should be simpler than in the deterministic side. side. <coughs> so what is the questions we can ask? So we, we do the same, like we have a bunch of plus minus one. We look on, at averages and we count the number of sign changes of these averages um, of a random multiplicative function from n up to x. So these problems like get like, so recently there were a lot of works on random multiplicative functions, especially Harper had many good results on random multiplicative function, but on this specific uh, topic of sign changes. So there was this uh, result of Emone, Heap and Zhao, which showed that almost surely uh, your uh, average of random multiplicative function will have infinite number of sign changes. So we did it by studying the Dirichlet series associated to this uh, random multiplicative function. And then uh, re uh, this year, like a few months ago, Ga uh, Geis and Yari uh, made this argument quantitative and showed that uh, the number of side changes is almost surely a triple log. So log index three is like log, log, log x to some power one over c for c strictly larger than two. So the best we can do in the random size is like a triple log number of sign changes almost surely. So then we can ask, uh, can we do that for characters uh, in the deterministic size? So let me mention other results that are related to the questions I said just before. So there were results by uh, Angelo Xu, Kalminin, Sandar Ajan, which announced it in his ICM talk, but I haven't, I haven't seen the paper which study the probability that there is no sign changes at all. So in both cases, uh, the, you can look at this partial sum and ask, can it stay always positive? Can it stay above the axis? So, uh, and you can see that this, you can, uh, they have some works where you can bound the probability that this happens. So you can see that if it happens, it's a really rare event. So it should happen for very few characters for very few legend of symbols, for very few random multiplicative functions, etc. So I don't state like precisely uh, what they prove, but there are a bunch of results on these on this, uh, questions. That was the questions, no, it was just, I heard something. <laughs> okay. So back to our, Character sum, so what we proved is the following thing, that for almost all fundamental discriminants, so for almost all D, so if you pick randomly your discriminant D, and you look at the partial sum, you will have more than log log D divided by a fourth iterated log logarithm. So something close to log log D, sign changes in a very uh, kind of specific, Find intervals, which is something like e to some power of log d, which is very small. So we can locate if you, so some remark here. So this is like uh, in the literature, like Baker and Montgomery were able to uh, produce a bounded number of sign changes in the full range. So when you look at all the sum up to d. So here we have a quantitative result of the number of sign changes, but uh, maybe like the most important thing is that these sign changes are located uh, for very small uh, capital N, for, for very small intervals. For instance, like this, uh, these sign changes occurred in intervals which are shorter than the one uh, predicted by uh, Vinogradov's conjecture. So these are, these are like, uh, uh, these e to the log d to the alpha are smaller than uh, d to the epsilon. And uh, our method like allows us, so we can like, of course, like I, I made it, but you can forget like we, I made an explicit um, estimate on the number of exception, ex exceptional discriminants, which does not uh, satisfy this. And it's rather flexible and we can like, uh, 
do the same thing for random multiplicative function, or we could look at uh, partial sums of Fourier coefficient of modular forms, etc. And uh, use the same kind of strategy that I will uh, explain uh, later. So, for instance, if we go back to random multiplicative function, we can uh, prove the following. So, it's exactly the same analog of uh, what we prove in the this uh, deterministic side. So basically, you will uh, in the proof it works exactly the same. Instead of averaging over these, you take expectations, etc. And you can prove that uh, for large x, the number of sign changes of your average of random multiplicative function is uh, larger than essentially log log x with high probability. You see, like with probability essentially one. So for almost or almost surely, a random multiplicative function will have at least this number of sign changes. So the thing you can ask now is, uh, is it the right order or can we do, what can we expect? So here, like the thing, if you look at some situation which is much more simple where everything is independent, so you average over, uh, you average independent Bernoulli variables. So plus minus one, not only on primes, but everywhere. So here's a well-studied object. So it's a classic random work. And you can see that for this classic random work, the expected number of sign changes when uh, n goes from one to x is of order square root of x. So it's much bigger than log log x. So an open problem, if you have any idea what, what we should uh, formulate as a plausible conjecture. What is should be something like log x should be something like square root for in both cases character sums and random multiplicative function. For instance, I haven't written down, but you can prove if you average like a Möbius function that you will you will have like something if you go all the sums up to x you will have like more than log x uh, sign changes. So you have like different behavior. And uh, so this is like, I haven't seen stated anywhere, like any conjecture on the expected number of sign changes in this multiplicative kind of random work. <coughs> so let's talk about uh, some related objects where we can uh, connect this to the problem I've just talked about. And I will need it later in the second part of the talk. So uh, our method allows also to treat uh, zeros of Fekete polynomials. So what are these uh, Fekete polynomials? But you still take a fundamental discriminant and you form the polynomials where the coefficients are the values of a Dirichlet character. So the, these polynomials were introduced by Fekete to study the associated Dirichlet function. So in particular, uh, you observe that if this polynomial has no zeros, then the Dirichlet function has no real zeros. So in particular, has no uh, Ziegler zero, and this would be a fantastic result. But uh, so he formulated the hypothesis that for large D, this polynomial should, should no, have no zeros between zero and one. This was like, quickly disproved, quickly, seven years, relatively quickly by Polya, which showed that in fact, for a positive proportion of discriminant, there is at least one zero of this polynomial. And then uh, uh, let me uh, tell you about another open problem, which is related to the one I told you about the random walk, which never crossed the X axis. There is a problem which was formulated by Chaola and Fekete, and then uh, by Sarnak again, and one in some later. Can we construct infinitely many primes such that uh, this polynomial, Fp, or infinitely many Ds, has no zeros on the interval? Is it, is it possible that this polynomial never cross uh, the x axis? So we with our methods, we can uh, we can actually 
lower bound the number of uh, real zeros of this polynomial and we can localize it. So it's the analog of what we do for character sums works for real zeros of the KT polynomial. So in particular, Baker and Montgomery conjectured that the number of real zeros should be of the order log log D for almost all discriminants. So there should be log log D real zeros. And we can prove that for almost all discriminants, we have at least log log D divided by uh, quadruple log of D. And the interesting thing is that uh, we know where these zeros are. So we know how close they are uh, on the how close to one these uh, zeros are. So we know how to locate in specified intervals of, uh, of these, uh, these real zeros. So like you, you see, if you recognize like, this quantity, like e to the log d to the alpha, it's really, you see that the connection with the character sums with where we were, we had like the similar expression to locate the sign changes of character sums. So indeed, like the two proofs goes more or less in the same spirit. And I will present the ideas in the character sum uh, case, and then just tell you that we can do the same for these zeros. So how do you detect uh, sign changes? <laughs> so you start from by this identity on the top here, like, that if you take your Dirac Lyell function, you can uh, apply partial summation and write that your Dirac Lyell function is just an integral of uh, your partial sums divided by some uh, function, some power function. So now, well, so it's related to study, of course, then this SKD and study the L function. So what do you do? If you, de de you take derivative both sides with respect to S, you obtain some identity, which will uh, involve the first derivative of L. And on the right hand side, you will have another function of U and uh, the partial sums of Dirac -like characters. So then if you apply some change of variables, like you can do it, and believe me, and you arrive on the blue identity on the bot at the bottom, which shows you more or less that on the right hand side, you have some uh, Laplace transform of your partial sums of the Rickley characters. And on the left hand side, you have something like L prime over L, which is like a nice, uh, object of study in analytic number theory. And you have a factor LSKD plus something one over S, which will not bother us much. So then the, the, the idea is that uh, if the left hand side change signs a lot, it will force the right hand side, the integrand on the right hand side to, sign, to have some sign changes. So this follows from a general result in analysis, which tells you that, um, which is the following, if you have a function defined on R, which has a Laplace transform, so you can define this, this Laplace transform, like integral of G e S minus SX, which converge for S strictly larger than zero. Then the number of sign changes of the integrand, so of G, is bigger than the number of sign changes of the Laplace transform. So in our case, what, what we have inside the integrals are our partial sums of characters, what we have on the left hand side is something related to the L function. So if you show that the left hand side, which is, which is this L prime over L, has a lot of sign changes, then you will have the same thing for the uh, partial sums of characters. So that's actually how it goes, but then we, uh, we have something a bit more involved, but because we localized the uh, sign, ch sign changes. So we know so we need something stronger. We need to control these integrals on uh, restricted intervals. So how do we show that the left-hand side has many uh, variations of sign? So we need to study what is on the left, which is more or less, if you forgot about the, the other terms, is more or less L prime over L for some uh, um, S for uh, applied for some Ds. And we know we want to understand this on average over the discriminant. 
So the idea will be to take points like very close to one half and see that when we take some sequence of points, there will be many uh, sign changes on the sequence of points L prime over L S. So the way to do that is to uh, model uh, this L prime over L by some uh, random object. So by like, now I've skipped a bit of things, but L prime over L, you can write it as a polynomial. If you expand it, you can write it as a polynomial over primes. And if you do use some like zero density theorems, you can show that for almost all D, it would be some short Dirichlet polynomial supported on primes, which are around E to the GX, if S is one half plus one over GX. So it turns out that this polynomial, you can uh, show that they are well approximated by Gaussian random variables with mean zero and some relatively large variance, one over 2s minus one. So when s is very close to one half, the things to, to have in mind is that this one over 2s minus one is very large. So when you, when you approach the central point, the variance like blows. So this is good because we have a Gaussian random variables with large variance. So if you have a lot of Gaussian random variables, which are all independent with large variance, you will be sure that they will take, uh, they will have a lot of sign changes with high probability. So what we will do, we will take a sequence of points S1, SR, with some like function, uh, so all points like are tending to one half, in the way that uh, the, the supports of the polynomial which approximate this L prime over L are disjoint. So different primes are involved in all the approximation. So because different primes are involved in the approximation, it means on the random size that we have like independent random variables. And then if you have independent random variables, which are Gaussian with large variance, you can deduce that uh, you have many sign changes. So what do you do indeed? Uh, you, 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 you take many points and you form the vector of uh, approximation and you on the deterministic side and you look at on the random side at, on the associated random vector. And with high probability by some probability results you are sure that these random uh, vectors will have a positive proportion of sign changes, which is very important. They change size they change sign, so we take positive and negative values, but positive large values and positive uh, and negative large values. So when you go back uh, to the deterministic side, it tells you that the approximation will have the same behavior, will have a lot of sign changes. So to do like to compare like to the random model, we need some result on the discrepancy and use the method of Lamzuri, Lester, and Radzivil. And from the approximation, you go back easily to L prime over L, and you saw, you see that uh, you have quantitative sign changes for L prime over L. So then, when you go back and use the results I told you about the sign changes of a Laplace transform, you have a lot of sign changes for the uh, character sums. So let's summarize. I had this identity. We selected points such that L prime over L is very large and takes plus and minus values. So on the right hand side, it should uh, it should also uh, has a lot of sign changes. So the SK because every this T factor is just positive, so it's not a problem. And we just need to have uh, this LSKD which does not kill the sign changes on the left. So if LSKD would be too small, it will prevent us to, de to deduce this result. So we need to prove a large deviation result for uh, a log of LSKD. In some sense, we should prove that for almost all D, log L uh, LSKD is not too small. So for good discriminants, LSKD is not too small. L prime over L goes plus minus at different points. So the same thing occurs for uh, for the partial sum on the right-hand side. 
So let me briefly tell you how we locate the, the zeros, which is like actually the most technical part is to locate, uh, you know, one of the difficulties to locate the zeros uh, on the character some side. So to do that, you need to know that uh, when you integrate from zero to infinity, the main bulk, so the main part of the size of this integral is from two parameters very localized. So you can you you can show that you can forget what happens close to infinity, forget what happens close to zero, and the main uh, so the integral is dominated by uh, what happens between y and z. So if you have that, it will tell you that indeed, like this uh, SKD, we change size between y and z. So here, like to deal with that, we uh, we use like uh, some like classical techniques on large sheaves, inequalities, and character sums. So I will not deal with that because I want to talk. I see the time is running, and I want uh, I plan to talk about something, uh, but the second problem, which is related to uh, directly characters, but exponential sums on the uh, unit circle. <coughs> So let me so let me move to something completely different, which is like the Mahler measure of a polynomial. So here, like we, it seems like we don't take any more about character, but we will go back to character uh, in a few minutes. So if you you can forget about the first part if you you were sleeping and like wake up and like uh, look at that. So if we take a polynomial P, we can define like uh, an object which is called the Mahler measure, which is just the integral of a log on the unit circle of your polynomial. So essentially, uh, this is the limit when Q tends to zero of the uh, Qth moments of P when you look at the moments uh, on the unit circle. So if you want, uh, this is related to, this is a in a, some simple way related to the zeros of your polynomial. So if your polynomial factorize in this way, so it yeah, has roots alpha i uh, here, but then the Mahler measure is just the product of the roots which are uh, outside the unit circle. So it's kind of uh, captures the information about the uh, modulus of the roots or any of any polynomial. So it's a, it's a, when you have a polynomial where your first thing you're interested in is you to locate the roots. So this in some way, in some condensed way, like captures this information. So you can say, uh, can we compute this manner measure for some interesting polynomials? <coughs> what can we say about that? So in the, in the last century, Littlewood studied a specific uh, important class of polynomials, which are the one where all the coefficients are either one or minus one. So you can form all the, uh, you, it gives you a bunch of polynomials. So if you're degree n, you have two to the n plus one such polynomials. And they have been studied like in all the aspects, like the, the norms, the Mahler measure, if you want a maximal size on the unit circle, you want to study the number of real roots, it's also related to some combinatorics problems, etc. So what's one thing which is easy is the second moment. The second moment, you can just use Parseval's formula and show that it's about square root of n, if you have a polynomial of degree n. Then we are, we are like, uh, so many open questions on this kind of polynomials. For instance, recently, a uh, famous conjecture was solved a few years ago about uh, the possibility of constructing a polynomial which plus minus one, which is flat, meaning that it stays more or less uh, of size constant times square root of n when you look on the unit circle. So it's something which like does not vary much when you look at the values of the unit circle. So this was called the Littlewood flatness conjecture and like it took some years to uh, to solve this conjecture. So it was just like as a historical note and we will uh, focus on, uh, not on this problem, but on the norms and the Mahler measure for specific families of polynomial. So in general, uh, the Mahler measure is bounded easily by the second norm, so we know it's smaller than square root of n. And uh, one question which was asked is, uh, does 
there exists a positive constant such that for every polynomial p of degree n, in fact, the Mahler measure is smaller than 1 minus epsilon square root of n. So can we like approach this upper bound constructing polynomial with plus minus 1 coefficients? So the largest known value is given by this polynomial of degree 12, which is gives you a Mahler measure, which is relatively uh, close to 1 times square root of n, which is just 0 0.98. So nothing tells you that it's the best you can do. There's no proof of that. So probably this is still not solved. <coughs> but people like um, looked at this external problem and started to study uh, families of uh, interesting uh, polynomials. And uh, for instance, they looked at all the family of all plus minus one polynomial and looked at what can we say on average about uh, this Mahler measure. So on average about all plus minus one uh, polynomials, they showed that more or less uh, you can compute this average and you have this ninth constant E minus gamma over two, which tells you that on average, a Mahler measure of uh, little root polynomials is square root of n times e minus gamma over 2, which is a constant which is not so close to 1, but is strictly larger than half. So because the average is like larger than half, then they ask, can we construct actually explicit sequence of polynomials which have a large Mahler measure? So Shoy and uh, Erdely uh, did that and constructed some sequence of polynomials with uh, Mahler measure larger than square root of n over 2. So let's now see what can we do with polynomials which are which are given by directly character coefficients. So I introduced again the Fekete polynomial. So if you take the coefficient given by a legendary symbol, can I understand the moments? Can I understand the Mahler measure? Can I uh, relate it to some more general problems, etc. <coughs> so, uh, but this uh, what is what was proved on this Fekete polynomial is the following results. It was proved by Montgomery that the um, maximum on the unit circle of this polynomial is uh, more or less understood in sense that is of size smaller than square root p log p and bigger than square root p log log p. And it's still uh, unknown uh, if of the right order of magnitude of this subnorm of the Fekete polynomial. So at the beginning, like uh, people looked at this Fekete polynomial or some related Fekete-like polynomials because it was like on many points close to square root of p. So it was an idea to have like some kind of flat polynomials for uh, with coefficient plus minus one. So what was proved about the Mahler measures of these polynomials? So Littlewood proved the following thing that for this specific family, he could prove like uh, this Mahler question, he could answer it and show that there is a constant epsilon such that this Mahler measure is smaller than one minus epsilon, square root of p. On the other side, like Erdely and Lubinsky showed that it's like almost larger than square root of p over two for large primes. And then a series of improvements led to the following thing that we can uh, have the Mahler measure is strictly larger than square root of p over 2. So it's somewhere between 1 minus epsilon square root of p and 1 half plus something small square root of p. So this is like what's the state of the art. It is like uh, we have like we know that the constant is not too small and not too large. And uh, in a uh, what about the asymptotic behavior? Can I compute it and like show, for instance, that it gives me very large Mahler measure? So it, it may give me useful uh, polynomials for the question of Mahler and uh, et cetera. So this, like if I read, like I quote the paper a survey of Erdely, which says that the uh, problem of finding an asymptotic for M for the Mahler measure seems to be well beyond at this moment. So it, there were no uh, conjecture uh, formulated for this Mahler measure. And we, we solved this conjecture, I mean, this conjecture which was not existing, 
we proved that uh, the, actually the Mala measure is uh, asymptotic. So for the important thing is that for fixed P, it's not an average over P, it's for fixed P, the Mala measure is given by um, some explicit constant times square root of P. And this explicit constant is not the one when you average all the plus minus one polynomial. It looks very close to it, but it's not the same. It's not E minus gamma over two. So it's like a new phenomenon which like uh, occurs for this uh, family of polynomial. <laughs> so how much time I have? I think I would skip the proof, but just say uh, something. So what is specific about this? Uh, what is important is that this polynomial when you average, when you apply, when you Evaluate at the roots of unity, you have what is called a Gauss sum. So you know it's of modulus square root of p. So it's pretty regular on the roots of unity. That's why you you could fall, think like a well, you could expect, for instance, that uh, the maximum modulus on the unit circle is not too large. And the thing is like <coughs> the value of the, of the roots of unity is something like uh, square root of p times some legendary symbol. So you have some kind of randomness on the values at well distributed points. And from this information, you can actually prove, uh, prove a very fairly general uh, result. So which will goes like that. So you want to compute the manner measure. So you want to integrate this log of fp, so you, you kind of look at what happens between two of roots of unity, you change variables, and more or less what you're like lead to understood is like this uh, thing in blue, which is the integral between 0 and 1 of log gpkt, where this, this gpkt is just uh, normalized values of, of the fakete polynomials at the point e to the k plus t over p. So our goal is to show that this actually converge when p is large to some constant. So the thing is like, as I said, this function like, uh, if, where you can, using the fact that you know what is the values at the roots of unity, you can rewrite this GPKT as some sum of nice function, some explicit function of t with some legend or symbol on the left. So it's something which has some randomness inside. And using this randomness, you can show actually that this GPKT with, with, uh, will converge to some uh, random process. And you will, uh, we will compute this matter measure as uh, values the same, uh, I mean, as the same integral for some random process. So as I say, the shifts behave like independent random variables. So you have legend or symbols, as we've seen in the first part, these are some, these are some constellation. There's some kind of random plus minus one with probability one half. The other part is some nice function that you can express by Taylor expansion. So you could say, okay, this function, I can approximate it by some random process that I will define. I will keep the same function and just I will replace the, the uh, the Dirichlet values, like the legends of the symbols, by uh, Bernoulli variables. So it will give me a function which is random, so a function on the space of continuous function. So it will give me like a random process on the space of continuous function. So it will give me a function between zero and one, given by this series. And the idea is that we can prove some uh, dis limiting distribution result, meaning that this GPKT will tend in some sense to this uh, random process. And from these results, we will compute everything on the random side and deduce that the, we have the same result on the deterministic side. So the main thing is the uh, main result is the following is that the sequence of random process given by this GPKT converges weakly 
to this process gx of t. So what does it mean? Like if you don't want to talk about probability, it just means that the second thing that if you take any continuous functional, if you average one over p sum of k between zero and p minus one of phi evaluated on these fakete values. So for instance, you can take phi to be uh, to to be the uh, integral of a uh, cube power. So you can compute moments, for instance. This is given by the expectation of this uh, random process. So indeed, like you can recover any information on these fakete polynomials by computing with an expectation on the right hand side. So now, okay, you can recover. So I will just keep proof because I have no time and go to application. So for instance, one nice functional you have is like the, uh, if you have a polynomial, you can compute moments. So comp uh, given a function and computing these moments is like a continuous functional. So you can recover all the moments from these results. So in particular, you can show and have an asymptotic for all the qth moments, which is given as an expectation of a random process to the q, etc. So it means that like a this like was solving a conjecture because uh, about the moments of uh, uh, fakete polynomials. Before it was only done for integer moments and it was done by a rather complicated uh, combinatoric proof. And here you have explicit asymptotic for the moments given by, uh, by an integral of an, an expectation of a random process. So you can tell me, yes, but this does not tell me anything about the Mahler measure because the, if I have a function and I associate the integral of log, this is not a continuous functional. So I cannot uh, directly apply our results. So just if I have like some time, I will uh, move to it. So on a more, let's say on a more uh, probabilistic, if I rephrase our results, it would be like that. If I take any rectangle on a complex plane, and look, and I look at the measure of t. So I look at the values and the unit circle of the polynomials. I want to know when it falls on a specific region. Then I can compute this by computing a probability when my process falls into this region. So this is a result on the distribution of exponential sums because the fakete polynomial on the unit circle is just this thing. It's just sum of k d n e to the two. IPN theta. So it tells you like when this, how this thing distributes in the plane. And the important thing is this is like, uh, as I said, is not for on average over primes, but it's for fixed primes. So finally, like uh, I have a picture that like this is like the picture of a re realization of a process on the complex plane. So it tells you how this like G X T distributes when T varies on the unit circle. And this should be the same. I mean, that's what we prove. It's the same thing. Uh, distributes the same when you look at the values of, of our polynomial. <coughs> I see something on the chat, but so let me let me finish with this. So as I said, we want to do the same for the Mahler measure, like to to solve, like to to, to have an asymptotic on the Mahler measure. We will need to prove what I wrote here, which does not follow from a weak convergence theorem. So if you want to know, like on the left hand side you have fakete polynomial, on the right hand side you have uh, expectation of log of our process, which would be some kind of Mahler measure of our process. The major problem is this like functional is not continuous on the space of continuous uh, function. So we cannot apply uh, our, our result because uh, this functional is not continuous. So it's not continuous, but the only problem is like we need to control, control the logarithmic singularities on the random size, side and on the uh, deterministic side. So we, we need to show that uh, sometimes like these integrals will not uh, blow uh, like, uh, on left and on the right hand side. So I will not enter in the details, but what we will do is like, 
we will consider first truncate look at when our function are not too small so when there is no problem like the functionals are continuous for instance if gp is larger than epsilon and gx is larger than epsilon but then the functional when i truncate and i look at only this part is continuous and i have my limiting uh, distribution result but then the problem and the main uh, the main uh, technical difficulty is to understand uh, the measure of uh, t on the unit circle such that uh, such that I have such that I have very small values, so such that I have some kind of singularity. So what we prove is that this does not happen too often. Like the measure, like of this, is like uh, some kind of control. So we can control the logarithmic singularities of this two integrals on random side and on a deterministic side. So this like, uh, yeah, this is like the main uh, main work, like say here, like with the main difficulty is to control control this, uh, this, uh, this specific uh, singularities. So I think it's like already 50. But essentially to control the singularities, the thing is to just uh, look at the formula on the bottom HPKT, and we need to understand singularities of some specific function, which are given like sum of a rational function with plus minus one, and eventually some zeros too. And this kind of function are not too hard to. I mean, with some work, we can show we can analyze the first derivative and the second derivative and see that it does not like it will not stay too much smaller than epsilon because it's very uh, it has some like control variation so when we anal an analyze like this thing for the deterministic side and the same thing so we know for one thing the epsilon will be uh, directly characters and the other side will be Bernoulli variables but would be some kind of similar uh, analysis we can then deduce a result on the on the Mahler measure of uh, polynomials so then we can uh, for the moments we don't need this because like we have continuous functional and we can directly compute all moments using our distributional result so maybe i will just uh, finish here if i have uh, i have time or not Um, sorry, Mark. Do you, I have you, some minutes? Yeah, you can take one or two more minutes, of course. Yes. So in practice, so you say maybe because this looks a bit uh, theoretical. You have this JX. We say okay, fine. Uh, how do I compute this JX in practice? But you can compute it by uh, you can truncate the series. So you truncate up to J. And then computing expectation of this, but it's just like taking all the possibilities of plus minus one. So here uh, on the on this, like on this XM. So when you compute expectation, you just compute an average over all the plus minus one coefficient of an integral of log of. Oh, here there's like uh, some sign missing m smaller than j. Of this, uh, of this function. Of course, it's a quite something like it takes a lot of time because two to the j is like uh, very, I mean, it grows very quickly. So if you want to, you need to compute a lot of integrals and then sum it. And then if you, if you do it, you will like kind of approximate the values I told you about the, for the Mahler measure of a KT polynomial. Of course, you could do the same if you want to compute uh, uh, the constant which appears in the moments. You will do the same. You will just do average of our coefficient and integrate uh, what is here uh, between the bracket to the Q. So you can compute everything on the random size and that uh, deduce this for any uh, asymptotic for any fixed large FKT polynomial. And actually, our method like does not need specific. It could be adapted for different polynomials. The only thing you need is that the values on the unit circle, I mean, values on the roots of unity or 
on a well set of a well chosen set of points have some randomness. So, for instance, uh, as uh, was like when we released the paper, uh, Michel Mosinghoff wrote to us and said, can we do the same for kind of shifted fekete polynomials, which are polynomials which appears in some extremal problems. And because like the, we still have some randomness for like this kind of polynomials, you could compute in, in uh, you could compute the minor measure for, for this kind of, pro pro uh, of polynomials too. So it not, does not apply only of this polynomial, but it just applies on something where you have randomness of on a well set, uh, well chosen set of points on the unit circle. So I will uh, think I will stop here.